Hello, I'm Steve Shaw, National Coordinator of Football Officials and Secretary Rules Editor for the NCAA. And today we're continuing our series of training videos for 2023, and we're going to be focused on game action from week seven. Now, before we get into our plays, I want to talk through some instant replay statistics for the year so far. We're averaging 2.2 stops per game, and that is right on par with where we were last year. As far as overturns per game, we're at 0.9. That's just below one where we were last year, but that's very, very close. And our average total stop time is one minute, 54 seconds. And if you take that one minute, 54, multiply it by 2.2 stops per game, instant replay accounts for four minutes and 10 seconds of our overall game time. Now, in terms of stops, catch no catch is our number one stop followed very, very closely by targeting. And if you take those two categories and put them together, that equates to 48% of all of our stops. And from those two categories, if you add three additional categories, scoring plays, line to gain, and fumble down, those total five categories combined equate to 83% of all of our stops. So if we can be really good in those five categories, we'll have a good game. Now, a couple of things I want to challenge you with this week. Number one, on the field. Remember, when we're working our mechanics, one CFO, we have to all be together, and especially on our clock mechanics. So I'm going to challenge you. Let's stay together on all of our clock mechanics and really our mechanics across the board. That's so important to our game. And in the replay booth, we're doing a great job on our overall time, but we still have 18.4% of all of our stops going over two minutes. If we can cut that down, that will be helpful. Now, I understand end of game situation or multiple components, it may take some time, but on a routine stop, if you get to two minutes and you don't have the video evidence, it's time to let it stand and move on. So with that, let's get on into our plays. Our first play this week, we're snapping from the eight, and we see the quarterback. He drops back. He's going to take off scrambling, and then he throws late down the field. The pass is complete for a nice gain out across the 30. Now, the line judge, who we know has primary responsibility for forward and backward passes behind the line, and if the pass is thrown in, behind, or beyond the neutral zone, the line judge has a flag down for an illegal forward pass. And as we go back and take a look at the replays, we're going to see that the quarterback releases the pass and his entire body is close, but his entire body is across the eight yard line and he releases the pass right at the nine. And so this is good work by the line judge staying home, getting this foul and replay can confirm that it is an illegal forward pass without even having to stop the game. So good job. And remember, this is one of our eight reviewable fouls in replay. Now, as we see the enforcement, we know it's a five yard penalty from the spot of the foul and it carries loss of down. The umpire starts at the 11-yard line, and I'm not sure why it's the umpire and not the center judge, but we penalize from the 11 and not the 9, which was the spot of the foul, so we miss the enforcement spot by two yards here. Maybe not a huge deal, but when we're near the goal line like this, we need to be very crisp on our enforcements. Instant replay. Could we use O to O and help out here? But overall, Good job by the crew, but let's be crisp on all enforcements, especially near the goal line. Play two, we have a punt. We're going to see that the kick is very high. The receiver starts to move up to make the catch, but the ball hits another receiving team player, and it is recovered by number seven of the kicking team at the 24-yard line. Now, he's going to take off for the goal line, but we know that any time that the kickers recover after the receivers have touched the ball beyond the neutral zone, they can legally recover it, but they can't advance it. But as we go back and take a look at the touching of this kick by number 19 of the receiving team, he is being blocked down the field by number 50 of the kicking team. And by rule, if a player is blocked by an opponent into a scrimmage kick beyond the neutral zone, that touching is considered force touching and the player is deemed not to have touched the kick. So if we ignore this touching, then the punt is simply downed at the 24 yard line by number seven and the ball will belong to the receiving team at that point. So good job by their recruit to sort all this out. Play three, we see that the quarterback, he's going to throw downfield, and number eight of the defense is going to intercept the pass close to the near side boundary, and it's a clean interception. 
But now, number eight and number two, they're going to take off running together across the field. They go across the end zone, and then they begin to meet up with other teammates and begin to pose with teammates by the Lamborghini that is well beyond the team area. Before this posing is over, there's at least 15 players in the camera, at least two without helmets. This is too much, and this needs to be flagged for unsportsmanlike conduct. And we've been doing a great job of not being overly technical with unsportsmanlike conduct celebrations, but this crosses the line, and let's don't let up and let these type celebrations get away from us. Remember, there's no latitude on direct taunting situations. We want those taunting fouls flagged, but use good judgment on celebrations. Don't be too technical. Let players celebrate together, but using a prop like this and posing with a big group way outside of the team area way too much. We need to get a marker down for this for unsportsmanlike conduct. Play four is going to be a really good pickup by our umpire. Now we see that the handoff goes to the back. He works to the left and then he's going to cut back across the formation and he's going to be taken down for about a three yard gain. Now we have a flag from our umpire and we get a good announcement from our referee. Holding defense number 45. Oh, and the defense. <laughs> And as we go back and take a look at the play from the end zone, we see that the left defensive tackle, number 45, he's going to reach out and try to prevent the right tackle of the offense from getting out to block the linebacker at the next level. He almost pulls the player's jersey off, but he certainly pulls him down. And this is a correct call for holding by the defense. Now, this is an area, again, where we don't want to get too technical, but this type action is clearly a foul. Good work here. Play five is going to be a two-play vignette concerning horse collar tackles. Now, our first play, the offense gives to the H-back coming around. He runs toward the boundary and is tackled by number 33 of the defense. And as we take a look at the replay, there's no question that the defender gets his hand inside the back collar of the jersey. But as we know by rule, in addition to getting their hand inside the back collar of the jersey or the nameplate area, they must abruptly pull the ball carrier down for it to be a horse collar tackle. And in this play, the tackler, he really just rides the ball carrier down. The ball carrier continues to move forward. He falls forward. So this is not considered a horse collar tackle. Now, as we look at the second play of the vignette, we see that the quarterback drops back. He's going to try to run, and zero of the defense is going to grab the quarterback by the back collar and abruptly pull him down, and we get a flag from our referee. Now, this is the type action that we want as a horse collar tackle, the abrupt pull down, but by rule, the horse collar tackle does not apply to a ball carrier in the tackle box. So after discussion, the crew is going to pick this flag up, and there's no foul for horse collar tackle because this action occurred in the tackle box. That's good work. Play six, we're late in the half, two minutes, 16 seconds remaining, and the offense faces third and four at their own 15 yard line. Now we're gonna get a throw out to the motion man. He makes the catch, but he's gonna be ruled out of bounds at the 16, well short of the line to gain, with two minutes and 10 seconds remaining in the half. Now, here's where our concentration and focus with the clock must be spot on. Remember, our mechanics here are when the new ball that we're going to snap is being relayed into the center judge or umpire who spot the ball, we restart the clock if we're not under two minutes. Here, we spot the ball, never restart the clock. The play clock runs all the way down to 12 seconds before we snap the ball for the punt. And the punt's going to go out of bounds. The receiving team takes over at the 39-yard line going in with two minutes and two seconds left in the half. That's a big advantage here as either the receiving team should have had to burn a timeout or let the clock run down significantly. So let's stay alert with the clock. It's so important throughout the game, but especially late in the half. Play seven, we've got a fourth and one situation with the line to gain at the plus 28, and the offense is going to go for it. Now, we see that the quarterback, he tries to hand the ball off to the back behind the line. The ball comes loose. The quarterback recovers the ball and then falls forward well past the line to gain. Now, remember, on all fourth downs, we have the fourth down fumble rule, which, as we know, states that if the offense fumbles and the ball is caught or recovered by another offensive player, the ball becomes dead. And if the recovery is in advance of the fumble, we bring it back to the spot of the fumble. 
And if it's behind the spot of the fumble, it's dead at that spot. But here, the ball comes loose at the mesh point with the quarterback in the back. And we know that anytime we have a fumble like this during the mesh point, we attribute the fumble to the player handing the ball off. So the quarterback recovers his own fumble here on fourth down. That's legal. It's a legal play that results in a first down for the offense. And good recognition of this play by the crew here. Our last play this week, we're going to take a look at a potential targeting play. And we see that the offense throws a short pass across the middle. Receiver zero takes a big hit from 31 of the defense. And we get a call from our back judge for targeting. Now, we see zero shaking his head trying to clear the hit away. But as we go back and look, we see number 31, he comes in, he lowers his head, leads with the helmet, and makes forcible contact to the receiver with the crown of his helmet. And replay can easily confirm that this is a targeting foul. We have an indicator, and we've got forcible contact with the crown of the helmet. And as we continue to look at this, the receiver, we would still consider him defenseless, even though he turns and begins to transition to a potential runner, even if he completed the catch. He's still defenseless, and the rule book says, when in question, we consider the player defenseless. So if this player was defenseless, this could also be a 9-1-4 targeting, targeting a defenseless player as the crown hit went forcibly into the receiver's head and neck area. So this is a correct call for targeting and number 31 is disqualified. Well, that's it for our plays this week. And there's some excellent learning plays here. And as a reminder, let's not get embarrassed or concerned if your crew makes the video. We all have plays that we can learn from. Now this week, let's be especially conscious of our clock management. Let's do a great job, not only at the end of half, but all the way through the game. Work our clock mechanics as we discussed in the preseason. That's so important that we do that. We want quality fouls, make it be there, nothing technical. And let's be great communicators. Communicate with coaches, players, and other officials, and always use your winning words. That's so important. Concentration, let's give everything we have for 60 minutes, and let's do a great job of staying in it every play. Be mentally and physically prepared to work the game after your pregame conference. And as we always say, integrity, courage, and poise. That'll get us through the tight situations. Best of luck to all this week.